Many people think about head restraints as headrests, but they're really not. They're important safety devices. Because rear-end crashes are so common in the real world, you're more likely to need your head restraint in a crash than almost any other safety device. When your vehicle is struck from behind, the seat is pushed forward and that pushes on your back. As it does so, your head tends to lag behind until the head restraint catches up to it. That puts forces on the neck. To reduce the risk of neck injury in such crashes, you have to make sure that the head and the torso move forward together as much as possible. In order to do that, you have to have a head restraint with adequate geometry. It has to be high enough and close enough to the back of the head. And the seat stiffness characteristics have to be right so that it doesn't push too hard on the torso. To evaluate head restraints, the Institute first looks at the geometry of the head restraint. Is the head restraint tall enough? Is it close enough to the back of the head that we can expect it to protect even taller occupants? If not, we rate the head restraint as poor overall. Now, if the restraint is acceptable for protecting taller occupants, then we do a sled test in which we simulate what would happen if you were stopped in traffic and another car hit you from behind doing about 20 miles an hour. We then look at the measures on this special dummy. It's called BioRid, designed especially for looking at what happens in rear impacts. We look at how hard the seat pushes on the torso. We look at how quickly the head restraint gets to the head and supports it. And we also look at the forces that we can measure on the dummy's neck. Based on these measurements, we give the seat a rating of good, acceptable, marginal, or poor.